everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Oklahoma producers are headed to the field to plant this year's wheat crop. And that's where we find SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our Extension Small Grain Specialist, David Marburger. So where are we with this year's wheat crop? Well, we're already getting some wheat put in the ground in some areas across the state. We had that cooler August, lots of actually rainfall during August. So we had soil moisture as we got into the end of, end of that month and with the low wheat prices this year, kind of similar to last year, some producers maybe want to target a little bit more the, the forage aspect of the wheat production. So starting to plant early, kind of that end of August into the beginning of September to kind of take advantage of that of that soil moisture. So we've got some producers who are, who are, who are up and going and then actually the kind of the ideal planting time for dual purpose wheat in Oklahoma for at least most of the state is going to kind of be now that mm -hmm. September 10th to about September 20th time frame. So we're kind of in in that window. It's just that now while we had that good soil moisture early now we're, we're starting to dry up and it doesn't look like we have a lot of rain in the forecast unfortunately. How, how does this year compare to last year's planting season? In a lot of ways, it's setting up to be similar overall. We mentioned it, the low commodity prices overall. Not a lot of people are excited about wheat, and you can't blame them. It's hard to get excited about those lower wheat commodity prices. So again, kind of targeting more of that fall, that fall forage um, aspect and wanting to plant a little bit earlier. So kind of that beginning of end of August, if you had that soil moisture into the beginning of, of September here. Um, the nitrogen, putting money into inputs o overall. Last year, one of those inputs that might have got slashed for some producers was just nitrogen fertilizer. Just didn't know where, where the wheat crop was going to be and didn't want to stick a whole lot of money into it. So going into this year again with the low prices, might be sacrificing a little bit on, on the nitrogen side. On, on the um, kind of more the management on the, on the pest, side of, pest side of things, last year we had wheat streak mosaic in a number number of areas and that they, they you get that green bridge from one season to another where those wheat crow mites which transmit that virus are living on those volunteer plants and that earlier planting date we weren't controlling those volunteers early enough so we got transmission of that virus into the sub into the 16 17 crop in a lot of ways that can be setting up again for for this year for that and then last year we battled armyworms right out of the right out of the gate with that early planted wheat. A lot of people having to spray for armyworms and also potentially had to replant several times for armyworms. And this year is setting up to be the same way. Probably already have heard a lot about armyworms from a number of people, at least from OSU. And for those who are planting their wheat right now or, or have it in the ground and had it into soil moisture and it's able to, to, to emerge, it's going to be getting out there early and often scouting those those fields for fall armyworm and trying to take care of them early. You mentioned some of the some of the issues comparing the two crops, but what what should producers really focus on this year to to bring about a really good crop? I'm I'm a big fan overall. I know with the low prices, I'm still a big fan overall focusing on on the basics. I think a lot of times we take take those for granted and they can hurt us more than maybe we realize. And I know people don't I always say it's not a very sexy, sexy message, mm -hmm. uh, but it's something to build a good foundation on. We don't build our houses on, on poor foundations, so why would we establish our wheat crop on a poor foundation? So focusing on those basic agronomic practices, using good optimal planting dates for the management system that they're in, good seeding, seeding rates, good seed quality, and putting that seed, seed at, the proper at the proper depth. And, and you have information on your on your blog that you tend to update. So on our on our blog, we put out any uh, wheat related information, especially things we're seeing throughout throughout the growing season. Just a couple quick paragraphs. For example, we had a quick blog on the, the fall armyworm here recently. Planting date, seeding rate considerations, that type of information to get out that you'll see throughout throughout the growing system. Okay, thank you much, David. And for a link to that, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And across Oklahoma, we grow primarily hard red winter wheat, but have you ever wondered about other classes of wheat? Hard red winter wheat is the, is the guy that can play on the offensive line any position. And then on the next series of downs, turn right around and play defense. Any position on the defensive line. It's that versatile. Another class would be soft red winter. Soft wheat doesn't absorb as much water, so we make cookies. Then we go to spring wheat, and it could be white, it could be red. Uh, uh, but one of the six classes officially is hard red spring, and that's more limited to the northern edges of the country. 
where protein levels can be achieved at a little bit higher level uh, than, than Harvard winter. There's durum wheat, that's a whole different uh, class, a whole different species, used primarily to make pasta products. And then we have uh, soft white in the western part of the country. We don't, again, grow any soft white in Oklahoma, although we could produce a soft white in the breeding program. It's used for a very specific purpose, oftentimes uh, in foods produced in the Asian rim, Asian countries, uh, also confectionaries, and then there's, there's hard white. Hard white is much like hard red winter or hard red spring, except the kernel color is much lighter. And so the whole wheat product that comes from hard white is going to be much lighter if it's a whole grain wheat product. We are trying to breed a hard red winter wheat uh, primarily. We're also trying to breed a hard white. We will also look at soft red winter and sometimes soft white. Oklahoma sits right in the middle of of the hard red winter wheat producing region of the United States. There has always been a demand uh, for hard white. We just haven't felt it so much locally here in this part of the country. There's demand for the same kind of uh, end use, the same kind of uh, processing characteristics that we see in a hard red winter, but without the darker kernel, uh, the brand coat. So with a, light, a lighter amber colored brand coat. Well, normally here in Oklahoma we hear that our wheat is great for bread because it's hard red winter. And that usually has a, a makes great all purpose or bread flour and makes good bread. So, but sometimes, um, you know, bakeries want a certain protein level of flour. The millers, you know, they are making flour to what their customer specifications are. So let's say there's a huge order and they have this narrow window of specification of 15% flour, 50% protein flour. If, if they don't have, you know, higher 16% wheat to mill, they'll have to probably buy in what's usually done as hard red spring wheat. It's inherently higher in protein, grown up usually up north, and it, they can, they can blend it with the lower protein wheat to get the target flour that they need. It's kind of where you can grow what type and what type can you easily sell. There has to be a, 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 a drastic shift in the way the, the wheat is channeled. But to maintain the integrity of the market class, you have to make sure that we are dealing with what is considered a white wheat and what's considered a red wheat. One of the main um, new breads you see is the white whole grain wheat. So that's a whole nother class of wheat. It's hard white winter wheat. We're starting to grow more of that in Oklahoma. The wheat breeding programs in our university and others, you know, they pretty much only offer varieties that are high milling and baking qualities. So sometimes the protein isn't there that someone might want, but the quality is. What we need to concentrate on is, is, is providing wheat of certain classes that we might be able to produce that we may not have produced in the past. Fall of the year is, of course, weaning time for spring calving operations all across the southwest, and especially here in Oklahoma, and for those herds that plan to put those calves in a value-added calf sale, weaning time is here or just around the corner. And that's a good time to remind folks of the management practice that gained some popularity just a few years ago due to research done out in California. And the management practice that I'm talking about is fence line weaning. And what do I mean by fence line weaning? Fence line weaning means that we simply put the calves on one side of a fence and the mother cows on the opposite side of that same fence so that during the weaning process they can hear each other, they can smell each other, but yet they're, they're not in direct contact. 
that kind of weaning has turned out to be a lower stressed uh, weaning practice as compared to moving the calves, say, in a, into another pasture, out of sight, out of mind, out of hearing contact from the mothers. When the University of California uh, folks actually compared those two weaning management practices, they found that the calves that had the fence line weaning, those that uh, stayed within earshot and could smell the, the mother, those calves actually got off to a better start. In the first two weeks after weaning, the fence line wean calves had gained 23 more pounds than their counterparts that were weaned completely separate from their mothers. And that advantage actually was maintained through 10 weeks. Those calves still weighed, uh, weighed about 26 pounds more than their counterparts that were completely separated from the mothers. Recent research done right here at Oklahoma State University by uh, one of the faculty members in the College of Veterinary Medicine, Dr. Taylor, has again shown that fence line weaning calves get off to a better start, and gain a little better in the first few weeks after weaning. So I think this is a management practice that many producers may want to take a good close look at. If you do, one of the key things to keep in mind is that we have to have fresh water available on both sides of the fence. We want to remember that this entire herd is going to be congregated in this area for several days. So having adequate water for both the cows and certainly those newly weaned calves. Remember to have water that those calves are used to drinking out of that they can reach and, and get plenty of. So, Fence line weaning, it's a management practice that looks like it helps the calves through that uh, stressful period a whole lot easier, gets them started in gaining weight so that they're going to be a little bit heavier if they go into that value added calf sale. And we'll get along a little bit better, we think, in terms of, of health right after weaning with those calves. Fence line weaning, consider it this year as you wean your calves this fall. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, is here now. Kim, we keep hearing this term, a washing grain. What does that mean? It means we got too much grain. Uh, you look at wheat, uh, any stocks projected to be a record 9.7 billion bushels. The five-year average is 8 billion. Uh, you look at corn, uh, 8 billion bushels, that's not a record, but still well above the 7.6 billion bushel average. Soybeans, a record 3.6 billion bushels. Their average is 2.7 billion bushels. We just have too much grain. Focusing on wheat, how much of the world has been harvested? Well, you look at the uh, harvested area, either acres or hectares, uh, we probably had 85 to 90 percent of the, uh, the acres cut. But if you look at the, uh, the production, to be cut, we're probably well over 90%. Uh, the Northern Hemisphere is essentially done. You got Russia still uh, cutting, probably 80, 85% done, complete. Uh, Canada still got some to, to cut. Southern Hemisphere, of course, Australia, Argentina, uh, the, uh, South Africa, the, those harvests will start probably in oh, mid to late October. Uh, Australia's having drought problems. Uh, their production is going to be 30, 35% uh, below last year, well below average. Argentina above average, uh, but they're having uh, problems with too much moisture and their production is right now, their expectations are declining. How long will it take the world to use those grain stocks? Well, if you look at uh, wheat, uh, general opinion is it takes two years to clear uh, wheat stocks. In other words, you've got to have two short crops. With corn and the feed grains, uh, they number one bad year, you can take that. And if you'll think about it, wheat can be grown just about anywhere and is grown just about everywhere. Corn and the feed grains, on the other hand, there's a limited area they, they're produced in. And so they, bad weather, and bad weather is going to determine when it happens. Uh, that can happen faster in the feed grains than it can wheat. So if I'm someone who has wheat in storage, 
should I sell it? Uh, if you've got wheat in storage, you need to continue to follow your plan. You need six cents a month to cover your, your carry cost or, or to keep it in storage, storage and interest there. Uh, we gained 15 cents the last of this week. So, you know, you can pick up that storage cost relatively fast. And I think the odds are higher that we're going to see, oh, 30 or 40 cent higher uh, wheat prices as we get out to December to January than they are that we'll lose 30 or 40 cents. Any other strategies for farmers? I think producers just need to be patient. I need, think they need to produce a quality product that we can sell on the world market and that price will take care of itself in the long run. Okay, Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Early September has been a time of cooler temperatures. The Spencer Mesonet site in the middle of the state provides a mid-range example of those cooler temperatures. A graph of air temperatures at Spencer from September 1st through the 12th shows early September's highs and lows. September 3rd and 4th were the only days with above average highs and lows at Spencer. The gold line is the 15-year average maximum air temperature. The red fill shows this year's maximum air temperatures. The blue line is the 15-year minimum air temperature at Spencer. The teal fill shows this year's minimum air temperatures. At Spencer, nighttime lows have been farther below average than the daytime highs. The lack of rainfall is showing up in soil moisture. There are a lot of brown dry areas on a map of the percent of plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches. Buffalo and Pawnee had only 9% on September 12th. Soil moisture from the surface down to 32 inches doesn't look quite as bad, but eight sites were at or below 15% plant available water. Here's Gary with a look at the lack of rainfall and increasing drought conditions. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, it looks like summer's returned, and with the summer heat and lack of rainfall, what does that get us? Abnormally dry conditions again across parts of Oklahoma. Let's go right to the drought monitor map and see what we have. So we've greatly expanded that D0 or the yellow part on the drought monitor map. That's abnormally dry conditions across the uh, far northern tier of counties and then down into uh, Logan and Kingfisher counties. Um, and also expanded that D1 moderate drought up in Harper County into uh, far northeastern Beaver County. Um, if we go look at the Mesonet rainfall maps, we can see why. Okay, this is the observed rainfall from the Mesnet for the last 30 days. There are pockets of uh, heavy rainfall uh, still existing on the 30-day map. That's generally starting to fall off as we go forward, though. But you can notice there in the far northern uh, tier of counties, that's where we get less than an inch of rainfall in general, uh, despite some few amounts uh, of one to two inches. And if we look at the percentage of normal rainfall map for the last 30 days from the Mesonet, it shows up even better all those dark reds and oranges up along the northern tier of counties, uh, generally uh, 20 to 30 percent of normal rainfall over the last 30 days. Add that heat that we have and uh, that's where we get our abnormally dry conditions. Um, it's not drought, but it is a precursor to drought, so it's something we're going to have to watch, especially as we get right into the, the heart of a uh, wheat planting season. For something a little different, let's look at the national map for the last 30 days. This is the uh, departure from normal precipitation. It only goes up to minus or plus 8 inches, but we can see the uh, impacts of the two hurricanes, but in general for the rest of the country, not a lot of rainfall over the last 30 days. It's all been concentrated down with those tropical systems down in the far uh, southeast uh, and along the Gulf Coast. We're just now entering our uh, secondary rainy season of the fall. Hopefully it'll start to pick up here as we get later into September and especially into October. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We're here now with Becky Carroll, our fruit and pecan specialist, to talk a little bit about how this year's pecan crop is looking. And Becky, it seems the answer is better than last year overall in Oklahoma. Yes, it does seem like uh, for most growers, it's gonna be a pretty good year. There's some spotty areas that, that may be lacking of, uh, some production this year, but, but overall it looks like a good year, so. 
And we're in the Grove at the Cimarron Valley Research uh, Station, which mm -hmm. is, is part of your jurisdiction. Right. Let's talk a little bit about some of the, the samples okay. that you've pulled. All right, so I just uh, collected a few pecans this morning. Uh, this is uh, a Merrimack, and it's, um, it's kind of a mid-season ripening, so it's still tight, and if it was attached to the tree, it would still be uh, getting nutrients and water from that tree. And um, so this one is a peruke. We're standing under a peruke tree, and it's a northern variety. And so the shucks have started to split, and they're one of the earliest ripening here at the station. So whenever the shucks start to split like this, these sutures just split. They don't have to dry down even. Um, once that happens, this nut has stopped getting anything from the tree. And so you can see where it was attached, but it's now um, ready to be harvested. So at this stage, you can go out and knock them out of the tree and pick them up and then dry them and um, get them in your barn or your building before the squirrels and the crows and everything else can take them off. Uh, but we do have a, a few more weeks left on something like a Merrimack or a Pawnee or Kansas. So it'll, it'll be a few more weeks on those for ripening. Were there any particular challenges this growing season that folks had to deal with? Um, a lot of areas had to deal with uh, excess rainfall at times. So there are some disease areas where scab pressure's been a little bit higher than normal. So, um, so they've had to rely on fungicides or may have a little bit more of uh, scab uh, build up on some of their shucks. And then in terms of quality, it's going to depend on the weather right. between now and the actual harvest. Right. We, um, whenever we have rainfall early in the season, the pecans get larger. They size with the irrigation or the rainfall. And then late in the season, once they're already sized, they start to fill from the inside out. And um, if we don't have rainfall during this last period in the fall, uh, the nuts won't fill out properly. And you and the team are organizing an upcoming field day that you mm -hmm. want to invite Oklahomans to. Right. Give us the details. We have a, a field day at uh, Night Creek Farms near Sepulpa, and it will be September 22nd. Its uh, registration starts at 2 p.m., and then we're going to have speakers from the Department of Wildlife to talk about depredation. The event is free, but we just need them to contact us and let us know they're going to come so we can have enough food. Becky, thanks for your time today, and we look forward to seeing how everything, everything turns out through harvest. All right, thank you. And for a link to the field day that Becky mentioned, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. Today, we take you to a county fair that has some really unique ways of serving up family fun. Sunup's Curtis Hare is in Cherokee County. There's an old saying that says nothing beats a county fair on a Friday night. Okay, maybe I made that up, but Friday nights are definitely a highlight for many fairs throughout Oklahoma. In Cherokee County, it's no different. We're probably one of the few counties around in the state that really still has a pretty big fair. Carl Wallace is the county extension director in Cherokee County. The fair has been going on for a few days, and tonight is the small animal exhibit. It's the most popular event, and probably the most hectic. It's a really, really busy evening. We'll have a, a lot of different uh, uh, people that will actually be coming in for the, the small animal deal. So. Jody, go over there and tell them to... People start piling in as the festivities are about to kick off. Taking a look around, it's easy to see who the fair's target audience is. Our whole fair is, is, enough, is really centered around kids. Now, don't get me wrong, we do have a very big open section to the indoor fair over there, but the rest of the fair is all about kids. Uh, and we try to have some just fun. County fairs throughout Oklahoma have all sorts of events for kids. But in Cherokee County, they offer something up a little bit different. Count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> hey, tell me about the turbo race. Uh, it's about my fourth year doing it. 
I have never won. I've always either gotten fourth or fifth. Blake Dostin is a regular at the fairgrounds. He comes strictly for the art and the turtle race. What other animals do you like to see? I can't really see them. My allergies are too bad. Next up is the dog and cat competition. A competition so fierce, only a proper judge can oversee it. Although this show is no laughing matter to the judge, especially the best dress section, the audience doesn't see it that way. We kind of tend to be kind of silly in some of the things that we do, maybe, but it's all about having a good time at the fair. The main event of the evening is the Rabbit and Poultry Show. It's a show that's earned its status. The thing that's the most unique about us is our small animal deal, uh, because everybody else probably has the, uh, the sheep, the goats, the cattle, and all of that kind of stuff. But our small animal deal kind of probably sets a different standard than anything else. In most places, when you go to a rabbit and poultry show, typically, especially the rabbits, they'll drop them in a cage and a judge will kind of walk through and pull those bunnies out and kind of handle them and such as that. Well, the bunny show here in Cherokee County, the kids will actually have them up there on a set of tables and they're responsible to pose them. The poultry show is the same as well. Today I'm showing my rabbits. I just got finished with showmanship and I'm waiting to see how I do on my showmanship. I got my other rabbits to show. Cherokee County 4-H'er Ashton Deerduff loves this fair. Three of her indoor projects got first place, which means she'll move on to the big fairs. Are you going to go to the Tulsa Fair? Yes, sir. Are you going to go to the, uh, the Oklahoma City Fair? Yes, sir. Her mind's not on that now. She's got five more rabbits to show, and there's more fun to be had tonight. What's so special about this fair? Well, it's close by and it's really easy and I just love it because my friends and family, I can show my rabbits and pigs. In Cherokee County, I'm Curtis Hare. That'll do it for Sun Up this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at Sun Up. Thank you.